Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who has only cried twice in his life. Once, when he was seven, when he was hit by a bus. And then again, when he heard that little Sebastian had passed. Ladies and gentlemen, the captain. Yeah, little Sebastian, you're 10,000 candles in the wind. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Dry your eyes. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today we are drinking Shiner Tex Hex Bruja's Brew. IPA by the good folks at Shiner. I'm told Bruja means witch. So this is the Tex Hex Witch's Brew. And this is one deliciously refreshing IPA with cactus water. Feel the healing powers of the cacti, my friends. ABV 7% garage grade. Four and a half bottle caps out of five. And let's give some praise and thank yous to our good friends that helped us out with this week's show. First up, a cheers to Sue in Smithfield, Utah. And a big we like your jib goes to Linda in Eastman, Wisconsin. Next up, we have a cheers to our friends in Parts Unknown, and it goes out to Margie D. Cheers to you. Another shout out to Jennifer V. in Parts Unknown. And make sure, look, if you have toe fungus... There's signs up. Don't take showers in the public shower stalls if you have toe fungus. And we also have a cheers to Paula M., who is a big longtime supporter of TCG. And last but certainly not least, a cheers to our friend down south, longtime friend of the show, John H. in Mississippi. Everybody we just mentioned went to truecrimegarage.com and they clicked on the donate button. And for that, we are grateful. Yeah, B W E W R U N. Get you some. Hey, you want to support the show? Go to the store page, truecrimegarage.com. Click on the store page. Buy yourself a t-shirt. I'll fold it up myself. I'll even give a little cuddle before I send it out. We got shirts for the guys and the gals and everything in between. So check that out at truecrimegarage.com. And Colonel, that's enough of the business. All right, everybody. Gather around. Grab a chair. Grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. For myself, I have guilt feeling. Uh, The thing that I think most about is not being there to help Keith. Uh, If something happened to him and if he did pull this car over here um, and he went with someone or whatever, not being there to help him, you don't know how much guilt I have not being able to help him. Um, As far as uh, them polygraphing me or doing whatever they need to do. No, I don't have a problem with it at all. My motto is to find him. I need to find him. I'm, I'm, I'm almost 65 years old. I've got health problems. Um, I want to find my son and I want to find him before I pass from this earth. So no, I don't have a problem with them, whatever they want to do. These new polygraphs are different than what I took before. Uh, you're hooked up different. They use a uh, like a uh, computer, uh, like a laptop, I think is what it was, and then put something under your feet. I don't remember doing that on the first one I took. But they asked, they he just, Detective Laughlin, the first one I took, they asked a lot of questions, yes or no's. And the, this last one's the same way, yes or no. But there was all five questions that they asked us, so... Uh, he doesn't get into what I did on the first one, but uh, these five questions they ask you, if you, I think that if you have something to do with his disappearance or know something, it's going to show. My name is John Laughlin. I'm a detective with the Wichita Falls Police Department Crimes Against Persons Unit. I'm currently assigned to the cold case position, uh, which is how I got to know Keith's case and his family and why we're talking today. I've been with uh, Wichita Falls. This is my 26th year. I've been in the Crimes Against Persons unit. This is my 14th year in this unit. So it's uh, 
felony crimes against persons. So robbery, homicide, sexual assault, drive-by shooting, unattended deaths, things of those nature. Uh, those those kinds of cases are what we investigate. Um, I am the only cold case investigator that our agency has, and I am uh, still required, or uh, part of my duties is to pull a week of on-call in the CAPERS unit, so whatever comes up then, uh, capital murder or, or anything, uh, it kind of takes away, of course, the, the time needed to work on these cold cases. And uh, this is a pretty voluminous case. Keith's case has been ongoing since the original report was made. There you heard it. We have Keith's father, Greg, talking about the guilt that he has experienced over the years after the loss of his son, followed up by the current detective who is active on this still unsolved case. But again, a very active, not a cold case. That is Detective Laughlin with the Wichita Falls Police Department explaining what it is that he does in the very difficult job that he has on the cold case case squad for me here captain what i look at when i see this case and after the details that we've gone through it really boils down to two points for me two points of interest for the colonel one being do we look at chris and michelle two people that we know that were with keith that night before he went missing maybe even one of the last people that seen him before he went missing or do we look toward this quote unquote meetup or this meeting that he had at some point that night? Because what we have here sitting in front of us is the cold hard fact that we know that Keith did hang out with Chris and Michelle that night. We know that they went somewhere. We know this because A, we have Keith telling his fiance on the phone after work that he was meeting up with some friends, he was going out with some friends. Follow that up by we have the surveillance footage that shows the three of them at the gas station, Keith purchasing snacks using the fiance's FINA credit card, Chris purchasing beer for the three of them, and then later we have Chris and Michelle's statements to police saying we dropped Keith off in front of his apartment in the parking lot at approximately 11.45 p.m. on that night. We did not see him enter his apartment, but we saw him walking up the stairs to his apartment. Apparently, at some point during that evening, Keith told Chris and Michelle that he was meeting up with someone, that he had to meet someone at 1215 a.m. on May 11th. And that is why he needed to get home at a decent time. So we have two points here of interest for me, Captain, either A, we should be looking in the direction of Chris and Michelle. Maybe they made up the meeting or B whoever he was meeting that night, wherever they were meeting that night, whatever they were meeting about is responsible for Keith's disappearance. I know Keith is a younger guy, but to me, this is a very odd time to be meeting somebody up at 1215. So when we take a look at the situation after we know Keith to be missing, there are some other points that are very interesting to me here as well. One, the vehicle, his vehicle that, that he was driving that night, which was later found in the church parking lot near his family's home, his parents' home, approximately a mile away from his apartment. That's a very interesting angle to this case. The other interesting angle is his apartment. And we said that the apartment was found locked by Carrie the following day. According to the notes I have, Captain, the deadbolt was locked, so somebody would have had to use a key from the outside of the apartment to lock that door. We also found the beer cans on the countertop. There were clothes on the bathroom floor. The bed had not been slept in. This all according to the police reports. We did ask the detective about that area specifically, and his answer was, was this, that the apartment complex, this was not a high crime area back in 1997 and still is not a high crime area to this day. So they do not believe that anything happened to Keith in the parking lot, going into his apartment or coming out of his apartment that night. 
police seem to be really honing in on the idea that whatever happened to Keith is directly that there is a direct connection from Keith to somebody that he knew. I agree with law enforcement because one, his friends dropping him off, didn't see anything or see anybody that was suspicious. It's a safe area, but also the car being moved into a different location. Is it clear whether or not his friends saw the car parked at his apartment before they left? That's a really good question. And that is one that we, that's what I'm here for. Right. That's one that we spoke to the detective about, and they, they did not recall seeing the vehicle. However, the thing that's weird about that is it sounds to me like that was not a question that was asked of them. Right. Now this case is 25 years old and they've been interviewed several times over this time period. So if that question wasn't asked back then, it gets really dicey on them having memory of seeing the vehicle that night or not later when they're interviewed years later. Well, again, it becomes more tricky too, because if you drop me off at my house, you know what my vehicle is when he's driving multiple vehicles from the dealership that you might not even, they might not even known what vehicle to look for. Correct. And the other thing here too, is I got to believe that Chris probably knew what kind of vehicle that Keith was driving just because I could see that naturally coming up in conversation because they both worked at the dealership. You know, he comes to pick him up in a Nissan Pathfinder from, from the dealership. Keith was driving the Mustang that may have come up in conversation at some point during the evening, but again, you're hitting on something there. I, I have a feeling that that vehicle must have been in that parking lot when Keith returned, because where I'm kind of left sitting is trying to figure out, did Keith drive that vehicle and place it in that parking lot near his parents' home, or did something happen to Keith and somebody else drove it and left it there? What's really tricky here for me is there would be a limited number of people that would know that Keith would use that parking space. So that right there would already shrink your suspect pool a bit. But what doesn't make a lot of sense to me is if I did something terrible to Keith, clearly I'm trying to cover that up. His body and remains have been so well concealed that nobody has found him for 25 years. Why would I place the vehicle in a place that I know that's going to be found and associated with Keith. Unless I'm hoping that somebody locks onto the idea that maybe Keith moved it there himself. And that has a direct relation to this meeting that was going to take place. Or possibly he's meeting some bad dudes and he doesn't want them knowing where he lives. So, Hey, I'll meet you at this church. And I think you might have something there, Captain, because his parents seem to feel the same way, that either somebody that knew he used to park there placed it there in, a, in some weird way to try to throw the investigation off, or, like you said, maybe Keith drove the vehicle there himself. He doesn't want these people to know where he lives for one reason or another and gets into their vehicle, goes off with them. Whatever happened to Keith happens later away from the vehicle, but maybe he leaves it there as some kind of signal to mom and dad that, hey, I, I placed this vehicle here and I went off to do something and you need to come looking for me. We should also touch on one thing before we move too far along here today, Captain. One is that the all the things and facts that we know about after Keith disappeared. So he goes missing on that Sunday and it's all agreed upon by law enforcement and all involved that he's missing sometime between 1145 PM on that Saturday night and before 6 AM when his vehicle is first spotted in that parking lot on Sunday morning. Later, we would learn that Keith left approximately $100 in his savings account, and he did have paychecks coming from the vehicles that he sold leading up to the time of his disappearance. So he had money coming in. Those paychecks were never picked up. We also know that he used his fiance's FINA credit card at the gas station when he was with his friends 
during the evening before his disappearance, but there has never been any unaccounted for transactions on her account with that card since that night. Does that make you speculate that maybe he was having some kind of money issues if he's using his girlfriend's credit card for a purchase? He very well could have had some money issues, and that's something that we spoke to his parents and law enforcement about. And we kind of get a mixed bag of, of answers here. So the general thought is this. He did have money coming in. He was having success selling vehicles at work. But we have the idea that he didn't have any cash on hand because he asked for a gasoline voucher. And it's believed that he used that voucher to fill up the Mustang's gas tank on that Saturday evening. We know that he used the FINA gas card to purchase some snacks at a gas station that Saturday evening. But he had money coming in. The thing here, though, too, is we say money problems, but Keith didn't have a whole lot of bills. He didn't have a whole lot of obligations. He didn't have a vehicle that he had to pay for right? because he's using the vehicles from the dealership. His biggest expense was his new apartment, which was approximately about $500 a month. So not a super hefty rent on his apartment. And he doesn't really have any other bills. Remember, he went to school on a scholarship. So while he might have had a limited amount of money coming in, he also had a very limited amount of money going out. And I don't know how his pay worked. Maybe it was one of those situations where he's getting a very low dollar an hour wage and then commission on top, or maybe he's just commission and those things, you know, maybe only, and those types of jobs sometimes only pay out the commission once a month. Uh, who knows? So yeah, money's coming in right now. So yeah, he has a job and he's making money, but when he's, is he actually going to receive that money? Again, I keep going back to this very basic idea. You got to cut these things down to the most simplest idea sometimes. And here I am left with the idea that he hung out with Chris and Michelle and they said that he was meeting someone at 1215. So either one of two things happened in my mind here, either Chris and Michelle made up this meeting and they are responsible for his disappearance or they dropped him off exactly like they said that night at 11.45 p.m. Keith had some kind of mysterious meeting with who? We don't know. Where? That's a good question. What's the meeting about? An even better question. We don't know the answers to that. If, in fact, Chris and Michelle are telling the truth, then we have to believe that this meeting is probably responsible for the reason why Keith vanished. So we wanted to know from Detective Laughlin if the people that Wichita Falls Police Department have interviewed over the years, if they have been cooperative with the investigation. Here's his answer. A yes, and that's a yes and no, of course. Uh, this, because it's such a voluminous list, um, there's going to be there's lots and lots of people that have been cooperative from the beginning. The last two people that, that were with Keith have been cooperative from the jump. Uh, they were interviewed separately without hesitation, uh, took past, past the polygraph exam. They didn't have anything to do with his disappearance or know where he might be, which is, of course, that's where everybody's going to look is uh, who are the last people to see him. Um, but just because they may have been the last persons to see him or report to the police that they saw him, obviously, if something nefarious happened to Keith, then then technically they were not the last people to see him. Whoever did something to Keith was the last person or persons to see him. So there have been uh, more persons on this long list of people to go back over and talk to that have been uh, cooperative within the limitation of memory. You know, it, it's just something that um, at that time in their life or even now um, wasn't a significant in incident or issue They'll tell you everything that they can remember about it, but there's just only so far that they could go, but they're still willing to cooperate. And then there have been others that have not. Um, they've either feigned cooperation that said, yeah, absolutely, I want to help you, and then didn't follow through or follow up. Um, so there's still more people to talk to, and there's still more work to be done. I, I do believe there are people um, 
that were within this North Texas community at the time that Keith, that Keith went missing that know something. Um, and it's just a matter of time before we identify them and identify what, if any knowledge they have or involvement they have. So you think that Chris and Michelle have been truthful, but has there been anybody that can confirm their story about that night? Yes, they have been uh, truthful and cooperative from the beginning. As I said, um, they would have been first persons that the initial investigators talked with um, and then followed up with a polygraph exam, which they uh, agreed. And um, Chris took one, and once he took his and passed his, he was – Michelle was uh, Chris's girlfriend. And so she, she knew Keith because cause Chris knew him, and Chris would hang out. They were coworkers. They worked together, Chris and, and Keith. And so she would have known him through through that arrangement and been around him whenever he was around visiting with Chris. So once Chris had passed his polygraph um, and with the, the the reported activity of them all three being together, they they didn't even um, ask or get Michelle to take a polygraph. It's not as if she wouldn't or she didn't. It's just they didn't see a need once uh, Chris had agreed, taken his and passed it. They were able to corroborate what they said based on their timeline of activity, of course, um, just to make a quick rundown on, I'm not sure how much of it will be covered in, in your presentation, but Chris and Keith worked together at the Ford dealership that day. I had previously, I think I, when I'd spoken to you before, I may have even given you an incorrect timeline there that he'd worked from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. He actually worked from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, and when he got off work at 6, he took this demo 96 red Ford Mustang home to his apartment. He only lived in that apartment for less than a month. He moved in in April. So it's just, it's just, just a little over a month had, had he been in that apartment. And Chris took home this uh, Nissan Pathfinder as a demo and came over with Michelle to Keith's apartment. And it would have been around 930, 940-ish in the evening when they came over. And, and it was a plan to get together. They're going to go riding around. They're going to go uh, stop by a few different parties. And just hang out with, you know, young people do this all the time. Again, I, we, two colleges in our town, it's not unusual at all for college kids or even uh, seniors in high school to run around and hang out, hang out at different people's places for different parties on the weekend. So they stopped by a convenience store. Envisional investigators found the charge rece- receipt that uh, Keith had used there to make a purchase. And they found the video recording that he was there to make that purchase. They bought some beer and they went riding around. Um, when they took him back to his apartment, uh, they made a quick stop at a car wash um, to, mu- to hose off all the mud that had been on their, uh, their pathfinder. They went off-roading by the lake after they stopped by a party. So they were hosing the mud off, and at some point, Keith makes mention to them during the evening that uh, he needed to be home because he was expecting to meet up with somebody later on. And so they took him back to the apartment. Uh, they dropped him in the parking lot. They saw him go up the stairs, but they didn't watch him go into his apartment and they left. Um, later on, um, when Carrie, Keith's girlfriend at the time, got to Wichita Falls and got to the apartment the next morning or next afternoon, uh, she had found the, some beers on the counter, just as Chris and Michelle had said, hey, when here we dropped him off, he, co- he took one that he was uh, already had open and he took a couple more for later on. Um, she found those there in the apartment. Um, they, she found clothing that had mud on it where he had gotten out of the truck to help wash it off and gotten some mud onto his pants and stuff. She found that there in the apartment and she noted that the bed had not been slept in. So the sheets, the bed was made, hadn't been pulled down. There'd been no impressions that somebody had laid in that bed or slept there. And that's kind of where the whole thing started. Once Carrie found that on the afternoon of, uh, Sunday, May the 11th. That's when she started calling around and checking with friends and, and talking to Keith's father and stepmother. And even, you know, the, even they at the time thought, well, he might have tied one on and slept it off at somebody else's place. Whoever he met up with, um, you know, it could have just been he went out partying with somebody else and he had too much to drink. So he stayed at wherever he was at. And they, they checked at a few places they thought he might be and didn't didn't find anybody that had seen him and didn't find him and it wasn't until um the following morning which would have been monday the 13th that it's like okay you know keith 
would have at least checked in by now. He's got to be at work today. Um, we're concerned, and that's when the police got notified. We are back. Thank you for the support. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast. And cheers to everybody. And make sure that you join us back here in the garage next week because we are going to have a very special and exciting announcement on next week's show. So you will not want to miss that. Trust me. And before we draw any of our own conclusions here in the garage, we wanted to present to you some more answers from the active detective on Keith's case. And a follow-up question to the previous question was that we know, according to law enforcement, that Chris, Michelle, and Carrie, his fiance, as well as Keith's family, have all been cooperative with the investigation as far as law enforcement is concerned. We wanted to know if there were other people, other friends, other acquaintances that were involved in his life around the time of his disappearance if they were, in fact, cooperative with police and their investigation. This would include anybody that would be in the Wichita Falls area that was a friend or acquaintance of Keith's, also former high school buddies of his. Yeah, though, yeah when the uh, Ranger, uh, when DPS got involved, they, uh, they were able to locate uh, a good chunk of all the different folks that knew him. Even since I've had it as a follow-up case, I've, I've talked to some of his friends, um, yeah, there hasn't, again, there's, there's been a handful of people that are either difficult to track down or locate. Um, doesn't mean they're uncooperative. We're just having a hard time finding them. There's been others that, uh, we have located that are, uh, no longer cooperating. Um, so there, there are folks, um, from Keith's past that whether they know something and they're just not sharing it or they had some kind of involvement in it. It's still yet to be determined and still being investigated. There's a couple key pieces of information that are kind of hidden in those answers a little bit, and we'll make them clear right here. So when they're doing their investigation, when Wichita Falls Police Department are digging through Keith's life and the timeline leading up to his disappearance, one thing we learned in one of those answers is that the timeline that's been available to the public might be different than the actual timeline of the events that we know that went down or that law enforcement knows that went down. The big difference being that it's always been reported in the public forum that Keith was at work from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. on that Saturday, and then he goes missing after he hangs out with his friends. What the detective said there, which changes that big time, is that he is saying their information shows that Keith was at work from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. So we now have an additional three hours of that evening that we don't know exactly what was going on. We don't have answers to fill in the blanks of what was happening between that time period of 6 p.m. and 9.30 p.m. when he was picked up by Chris and Michelle. There are a couple of things that we do know that occurred that day, but it's hard to feel confident about the time, the time, uh, the times when these events occurred on that day, knowing that our times have shifted already on that day. So we know that after work that he gassed up the Mustang. And we also know that he spoke with his fiance at some point via a telephone call. So we know those two things happen. It just gets very difficult, Captain, to put a time marker on both of those items when we now have an additional three hours to fill in that timeline on that Saturday. What we have to remember about Keith is that he went away for college, but now he's back. So he's back at his old stomping grounds, four years of high school there, playing sports, doing well, pretty popular guy. 
So now that circle of individuals that we have to look at is getting even bigger. And we know that when he was back in town, he was hanging out with guys he used to hang out with in high school. Yeah. And that's really interesting to me here, Captain, because again, it sounds like law enforcement believe Chris and Michelle's version of the events. And that's that they dropped him off and he had a meeting with somebody after they dropped him off. Who could that person be? We don't know. But now that we know that police have these other people that they are aware that he was hanging out with, that he was probably going out with in the evenings, that now they have people that they can look at to see who he possibly was meeting with that night. And again, I still think that this boils down to either A, Chris and Michelle know what happened to Keith, or the person or persons that he was meeting after they dropped him off know what happened to Keith. Well, let's throw a little wrench into this whole scenario, though. This could be a big wrench. It depends on who you talk to. Well, yes, I agree. So the rumor was that Keith was starting to gamble. It's not really clear with who. Correct. That's a really tricky thing here because what we are told is that his parents, this is something that they were not aware of. They didn't know that Keith was gambling on basketball. That's the detail that they're able to fill in, that Keith was gambling on basketball around the same time that he went missing. You brought up a good point. We don't know with who. Was this going on with people he knew from the car dealership at Ron Roberts Ford? Was this going on with his friends that he's hanging out with in the, in the evenings after work? Or is it going on with both groups? It wouldn't be unheard of for a young man to be gambling on sports with his friends or gambling with his co-workers on sports, especially when we're talking about a car dealership or salespeople. That's kind of, it's a bit of a gamble itself, that occupation, when you're living off of a commission check. Do we have any speculation on how much money he was betting? Well, one thing that's really interesting to me, when, when we're trying to figure out the details of this idea, because now you bring in to a whole separate mix of people that he could have been meeting with that night after Chris and Michelle dropped him off. Could this meeting have to do simply with his gambling? Could it have been a friend of a friend or somebody that he didn't really know or a bookie, somebody that he was going through to make these bets? We know that it's been reported that he was betting on basketball. And again, his parents didn't learn this until quite some time after he went missing. The police found this during the course of their in investigation and interviewing people that knew Keith. One thing that we do know that took place is that at some point Keith tells his fiance that he had made a wager on a, on some basketball bets or a basketball bet. He had placed a wager or wagers and that he was going, if he won, he would have enough money to pay their rent for a couple or a few months. It's a little unclear 25 years later what his exact words were. That could be a lot of cheddar. This brings up the obvious question of how well do we think that the people that worked with Keith at Ron Roberts Ford were interviewed and vetted at the time when this investigation first kicked off. We do know from law enforcement that they really took a good hard look at at these individuals in 1997 and then in 2002 when the state got involved in the investigation as well. We wanted to hear it from the detective. How well were these individuals at Ron Roberts Ford interviewed early in this investigation? Yeah, I trust uh, implicitly the, the investigators that worked before me, I do not question any of their work and um, what they did with their interviews and the people that did take and pass polygraphs back then and how they vetted that. I, I'm confident in, in what the, in their work. Um, but I will do just as I, just as I was telling Mike, I, I'm going to go back over this list again. And if there's anybody on there, even if they've already spoken to someone, I'd like to hear it myself. And I'd like to go back over it to make sure that I'm not missing anything. And we do have something new that's going to help us in our investigation as the 25-year anniversary of the day that Keith went missing is approaching. Can you fill us in on that, Detective? I have met with uh, our 
Crime Stoppers coordinator, and he met with the board of directors for our Crime Stoppers, and they have agreed to raise the reward for information leading to the whereabouts of Keith um, as confirmed through DNA analysis to $25,000. I mean, this is a very difficult missing person case because we have a timeline that's altered. We have individual stories that are incomplete at best. You know, we hung out with this guy all night. He was supposed to meet somebody after we dropped him off. Who was this person he was supposed to meet? I don't know. I don't remember. You have the new job. You have the new fiance. You have the new apartment. You have him driving different vehicles. Again, that that makes it a lot more. Just the fact that he drove multiple vehicles makes it that much more difficult of a case to figure out. I think chances are if you're meeting somebody that late at night, it's not for the best of reasons. And if what his fiance is saying is true and he could have won a bunch of money, that meant he bet a bunch of money. It didn't seem like he had it in his own pocket at the time. So then does he become collateral damage because he can't pay up? Well, I'd like to say, Captain, that you hit the nail on the head. I can't, though, because the problem here in this case, and it's something you're pointing out right there very astutely, there's too many damn nails in this case. When you look at somebody who goes missing or they are a victim of a homicide, you first want to take a look at what is going on in their life that may be different from when everything was peaches and cream, right? And you hit a lot of those nails on the head. The new apartment, the fiance moving in, the new job. He's running around with some of his old friends from high school, and he's gambling on basketball. These are all things that were relatively new in Keith's life that were new leading up to the point of his disappearance. We know that because all of these things took place after he moved back home from college in January. So five months earlier, within the last five months, all of these things are new. There's a lot of moving pieces and parts in Keith's life. And it gets really difficult to narrow down on what direction we should be looking at. So I look at this case and I see just what you said, Captain. Could this, this has to do with one of those pieces, in my opinion. It has to do with either the new job, the new apartment, the gambling, hanging out with the old crew. Now, let's go to the gambling for a little bit because lucky for all of us here in the garage, we have somebody that's pretty well has has good experience doing that on both a legal and illegal front Mm. and if law enforcement is listening trust me i have gambled on uh sports illegally but it was so long ago that the statute of limitations would never hold up all the charges have expired Yeah, it was back in 1907 that's correct i lost a fortune now Basically, the, the reason why sports gambling in a casino is so much better than going through a bookie is because in a casino, it all happens the same way. You don't have to guess what the guy is up to, how his system is, what your costs are, what your fees are. It's all laid out there for you, black and white. You can look at the numbers, you can read the newspaper, you can find the numbers online, and you know exactly what you're going to pay, you know exactly what you're going to win. It's very easy. You go in, you place your bet, there's no problems. You go back and you cash in your ticket or you throw it away, depending on the outcome of the game and the outcome of your wager. If you are going through a bookie, now they all have a slightly different system, But the usual system and the usual way that this works is you're basically doing a double or nothing gamble every single time. So to break it down and make it simple to those that have never experienced this, let's say you were to gamble on a basketball game this afternoon and you liked the Chicago Bulls. All right. You're going to give up some points if you go through a bookie. If you go to a casino, you can bet the money line, which no points are involved, or you could get the points involved. That's neither here nor there. What we're going to focus on is the illegal aspect of it because of what law enforcement and his family are saying. He was gambling illegally. Sports gambling in 1997 was not legal in the state of Texas. So going through a bookie, you're basically going double or nothing. 
So if you were to wager $100, you risk losing all 100 for the chance at winning $200. Now, if you lose, you have to pay juice. And juice is typically 10 to 15%. 10% being the majority of the time. 90% of the time, you're going to pay 10% juice. So you can make a $100 wager with the hope to win $200, or you can lose your $100 and have to pay an additional $10 fee for placing the bet with the bookie. Make sense? Pretty simple, right? I am picking up what you're putting down. Let's go back to Keith's words, because when we look at this and, and we say, all right, maybe this gambling is what caused his disappearance. I'm not going to rule that out completely, but I'm just trying to add a little more information to that angle. His words to his fiance was that if I win this bet, I'll win enough money to cover the rent for a few months. Right? She never says what dollar amount he thinks that he's going to win. But his words were that I could pay the rent. We won't have to worry about the rent for a few months. We know from his family that he was paying approximately $500 a month for rent. So let's use his words. We won't have to pay the rent for a few months. Three months, four months, that's $1,500 to $2,000 at best. That means that his wager with a bookie would have been for $750 cash or $1,000 cash, double or nothing, plus the juice if he loses. What I'm getting at here, to me, that does not seem like the amount of money to take someone's life. Usually, these individuals are dead set on collecting the money. It gets really difficult for them to collect the money from you if they kill you and you don't have that money on your person. Keith had money coming in from his job, and he was doing good at his job. So my thought goes to maybe the reverse. Maybe it's not a situation where he was losing this wager and someone came to collect. But what about the reverse where the money is doubled? He won. And he won. Mm -hmm. And he went to collect. And all of a sudden, somebody's not such a good bookie and they don't want to pay him. Maybe an altercation breaks out. I guess the same would be true on the reverse of that as well. But we should also look at this at the idea of maybe he won that wager. I have a difficult time believing that this had much to do with a basketball bet because it was May 10th when he went missing. Easy enough for us. There's not a whole lot of basketball that's being played on May 10th. It's the NBA playoffs and that's it. There's no college basketball. There's no regular season games on May 10th. It's all playoff basketball. Well, On that day, on Saturday, the Bulls played the Hawks at noon. The Jazz played the Lakers at 2.30 p.m. This is all Wichita Falls, Texas time. One thing that we do know that happened that day, again, we can't put a time marker on it because our timeline has altered based off of the detective's words. He called his fiance, spoke with her via telephone after he was off work on that Saturday. That could have been as early as 6 p.m., could as could have been as late as 9.30 p.m. before Chris and Michelle picked him up. The problem with that phone call then becomes this. If his words are, if we win, I can cover the rent for a few months. The problem with that statement, regardless of what time we put that phone call, at 6 o'clock at the earliest or 9.30 p.m. at the latest, both of those games are over for the day. So he must have been talking about a wager that he was going to make on Sunday, which doesn't make any sense that it would have anything to do with him going missing because he went missing Saturday night. So the gambling thing certainly throws a wrench into it, but I wonder if it's just a red herring that has nothing to do with why we don't know where he is. Right. Well, it also makes it, again, more difficult because it's not like we have somebody coming out and saying, we know for a fact that he was meeting with his bookie or meeting with somebody that was involved in this gambling. And because he went to high school there, he has a bunch of old friends that he could have met up with, a bunch of old acquaintances he could have met up with, and who's to say he didn't meet up with a female that night? 
you really have to leave everything on the table here in this case until you can start crossing some of them off. And that's why I wanted to try to, and I know that I didn't completely, but try to cross off maybe this gambling. The thing that's difficult though here too, Captain, and I trust Detective Laughlin. He's got a stellar record. He's a cold case detective who has cleared four cases which I don't know that the general public know how difficult clearing cold cases are, but this man and his unit have cleared four. And we say unit, and he says, you know, I've done this with the help of my fellow men and women that I work with. But at the same time, you hear him say in his introduction, I'm really the only one in this unit. So he's done a damn good job over the years clearing these cold cases. But one thing that I have a difficult time with, is when I hear that Wichita Falls has cleared, that's kind of his words, that we've moved on past Chris and Michelle, who we know that he was seen with that night. The reason why I can't move on from Chris and Michelle is the fact that we are told that Chris took a polygraph test and passed, and he's been cooperative. Michelle has been cooperative, but she was never asked to take a polygraph test. Don't email me and tell me what big batch of bullshit polygraph tests are, I understand what they are. What I'm saying is if you are using them to eliminate people, then we need to look at it as such. One took one, one was not asked to take one. The problem with that is if you are going to believe the one that took one, that both of their stories are right based off of that polygraph and their cooperativeness, well, then the other person should have taken one too. Who's to say that this Chris fella that he worked with at Ron Roberts isn't some kind of closeted psychopath that has the ability to untruthfully answer these questions and pass the polygraph test. And the reason why I circle back to that is because the only people that say the only people in Keith's entire life that say that he was meeting anyone at all that night was Chris and Michelle. We need to figure out how truthful that item is, because if that is truthful, then that means Chris and Michelle had nothing to do with it. And whoever Keith was meeting had something to do with his disappearance. Now, Chris and Michelle would have had the ability to stage his apartment to make it look like he had returned that night. Again, it's only Chris and Michelle's word that they dropped off Keith and that he was walking up to his apartment, but we never saw him go in. They say he had the meeting. They say they dropped him off. The evidence at the room at his apartment makes it appear like Keith came back to the apartment that night. But the problem with that becomes, what is the evidence? That the door was locked? That there were beers on the counter? That there were clothes, there were clothes on the bathroom floor? The bed wasn't slept in? Uh, me and the captain could lock that door, place beers on the counter, and put clothing on the bathroom floor. Or on top of that, because there's two of them, hey, uh, meet me down at the church. Let's move his vehicle. And we have his parents who said that Chris would have known that Keith parked vehicles there at that spot. Now, I want to be clear, not trying to point a big giant finger at Chris and Michelle. I'm just simply saying that I don't think that we can move on from either of them yet. I think that a good follow-up would be to Keep them on the possible list because until until both have been polygraphed, if that's going to be your method of clearing people, then we need to polygraph both of these individuals. Again, I do feel confident in what the detective is telling us, so I don't want to stay on this too much. The other outside factor here is what was going on at Ron Roberts Ford. We know that he had worked there for about eight weeks before he went missing. And there have been rumors about this dealership throughout Wichita Falls for 25 years, for the entirety time, for the entire time that Keith has been missing. Some of these rumors include that some of the individuals working there were involved in narcotics, were involved in the movement of drugs, maybe even using those vehicles to transport drugs. There's even been rumors that when they built or renovated the place that Keith might be buried at the location. These things throw a whole nother big wrench into this story. 
Could it be as simple as Keith took the wrong car that somebody had stashed a bunch of something in that trunk of that car and Keith signed it out, not knowing that he had taken someone's stash or moved something that he wasn't supposed to move or something that somebody needed access to right away. It's a very difficult case. And again, there's too many nails to hit the right one on the head. The thing that I can't get over is the movement of the car. I'm supposed to meet somebody up again, not clear if it was supposed to be at his new apartment or if he's going somewhere to meet them up. But to me, Oh, I'll meet you at the parking lot of the church. That Well, that's a good place for you to pay me my money or for me to pay you the money. But I don't think he had money. He was working at this job for not a long time. These are commission-based jobs, or at least a portion of your pay is commission-based. And so it seems like he was in some need to get some fast money. And whether that was to do a job of moving drugs or that was through this gambling. But I think the movement of the car is really important. And because there are so many different avenues that this investigation could take, that is why Wichita Falls Police Department needs your help. That is why, more importantly, Keith Mann's family, you heard his father and his stepmother, you heard the emotion, the heartbreak in their voices. That is why his family, Keith's family, needs your help. Because law enforcement is convinced, and I am as well, and so is the captain, that it's been 25 years and that somebody, whoever's responsible for what happened to Keith on that night, they've probably told somebody. And there are other people that weren't responsible for what happened to Keith that know what happened to Keith, that they've heard rumors or been told stories. And for whatever reason, They've not felt comfortable coming forward with that information. Now's the time. It's 25 years later. Give the family some hope. Allow this father to bring his son home after all of these years. Make a phone call or submit your tip online. The reward has been increased to $25,000 simply for the location of Keith's remains. They don't even have to bring charges against somebody to pay out that reward. They just want to bring Keith home. And before we close out, we'll have Detective Laughlin tell you the best place to send your information. Okay. Straight to me is my, my phone number is 940-761-7762. And that's to the CIS secretaries. And then they will transfer the call to me. They can email me, my email address, Mike, you, we've exchanged emails, so you have that, just john.laughlin at wfpd.net. And then if they want to remain anonymous, uh, there's two things they can do. They can call our Crime Stoppers, um, which is 322-9888, or if they're calling uh, long distance, the toll-free number, I think, is... Uh, 1-800-322-9888. We also have a Crime Stoppers website that is wfcrime.com. It's always good when we can talk to individuals involved in the cases, whether it's law enforcement or family members. So we want to give both of them thanks. In this case, somebody saw something, somebody knows something, somebody heard something. Please come forward with information. Thank you so much for joining us here in the garage, and thank you for being quiet during the taping of the show so everybody else can hear us out there. If you need more True Crime Garage for your earballs, check out our bonus show. It's called Off the Record. LeBron James gives it two thumbs up. Kristen Wiig says it's not only smart, but it's also sexy. So thank you for that nice compliment. Get that bonus show on Stitcher Premium. $5 a month, people. And you get some extra goodness. But Colonel, do we have any recommended reading for this week? Uh, Yes, we do, Captain. This week we got some recommended listening. Please listen to the Criminology Podcast. We did this last year, Captain, when we teamed up with the Missing Persons Pod. 
when in the same week to bring as much awareness to a case as we possibly could, well, we here at The Garage and The Missing Persons Pod both covered the Paige Coffee missing persons case out of the greater Cleveland area. Unfortunately, Paige is still missing and we still very much need the public's help in that one. This week, check out the Criminology Podcast hosted by the two Mikes. Good friend of the show, of our show, Mike Morford. He's the Zodiac, the man that knows all things Zodiac. They will be releasing an in-depth look at the case that we just covered, the Keith Mann missing persons case. So please, please check that out. Check out our friends at the Criminology Podcast. You can find that recommendation and many more on our recommended page at truecrimegarage.com. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure you subscribe. And until next week, be good, be kind, and don't live. Thank you.